Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Easter, Christ is risen. That series, you just saw that bumper, that was a series we're starting next week on relationships. I think it'll be a, a great opportunity for us to grow in that area. I think all of us can grow in that area. Uh, God does renewal when we work at it. When we, and I love stories of renovation, of renewal. Uh, we had two big ones just this past week. You know, just last Sunday, a week ago today, uh, Tiger Woods. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what happened with him. I mean, he won the Masters. That's like big. And uh, we, most of us have been following his story because he really put golf back on the map. I mean, the popularity of golf is, has really followed him. And when he, when he didn't do well, that hurt the golf news. But, you know, I mean, we care about Tiger and, and, and some of the story. I mean, he just was he was world class, right? He was number one. He was headed to break all the records. And then he had that, that, uh, that problem season in his life. I mean, it was bad. It started in 2009. <clears throat> of course, we all know about extramarital affairs that ended in divorce. Right that same year, he got into a car accident, pinched a nerve in his, in his neck. That really hurt his golf game terribly. He hurt his knee, tore his meniscus, tore his ACL, had multiple surgeries on his knee, and then he hurt his back real bad. He had like this terrible spinal problem in his back, and I mean, one, a couple times he just would collapse right after he drove a ball and, and, and couldn't play anymore. It was so low for him. It, he, he told people, he goes, I think I'm done. I think it's over for me. And uh, then 2017 seemed like the all-time low. I mean, he was arrested for uh, driving under the influence of these painkillers, or five different painkillers to keep up with the pain. And, and uh, it just looked like it was over. Right? It just looked like it was over. Then he went uh, two years ago to a specialist in England about getting his spine fused. And it was risky. Obviously, we're operating on the back is always risky. He went through that procedure and then started his progression back, won a tournament last year, and then ended up winning the Masters. And it's been uh, 11 years since he's won uh, any major, and, since, and it's been 2005 since he won a Masters. Most people said it was an, uh, the best sports comeback ever. I mean, it just looked like he had, there was no hope for him. He was below, there was a thousand people above him at one point. They, and that was after he was number one. They just said, no, everybody, I mean, he's out of the race. I love stories like that, where it's just stories of renewal, of comeback, of renovation. Then the very next day, there was another story of a renovation, at least the beginning of one, because you had the cathedral, Notre Dame, in Paris, France, burned almost to the ground, I mean, just gutted it out, terrible fire, and, uh, and that was built back in the 12th century. I mean, it's, it's, and it took 107 years to build. It's been standing for 850 years. People are saying, hey, the, the material they used in those days, the craftsmanship, they're not even around anymore. In fact, the architectural drawings aren't even around. Those were from, from the 12th century. But, you know, the government officials, the church officials, they said, we're going to build it. We're going to renovate this, this cathedral. And so they've already raised a billion dollars. Experts say it's probably going to be $2 billion uh, to, to renovate a church facility, $2 billion. And it's going to take five years just to gather the material they need and get the plans together. And then it's going to take another you know, 15, 20 years to be able to, to renovate. Another story of you know, this renovation. I think 
You know, I think that stirs me. I'm probably, it stirs a lot of you when you hear about a life uh, that's, that's uh, being renewed or, 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 you know, some great renovation because there's something in us that we, we hope for that. There's a hope in us. And, you know, God is a God who believes in renovations, not so much with maybe church facilities or buildings, but certainly with people. He is committed to seeing people uh, have lives that are restored, that are renewed, especially when we're in a bad place in our life. We go, hey, I don't know about me. I don't think, I'm not sure I'm in that place. This is week, this is Easter, right? Over all over the globe, over a billion people are celebrating that God does miracles, that God renovates. I mean, God renews. I mean, Jesus was on Good Friday, was crucified, and then Easter, that's like the ultimate renewal, you know, being raised from the dead, no matter what situation you're in. Because sometimes you just, maybe you feel like, hey, my situation's hopeless. Reminds me of the guy who was jogging at night. He's jogging on this road, and he decides to take a shortcut to go home. So he cuts through the cemetery. Cuts through the cemetery, he's running, and he accidentally falls into a freshly dug grave. They were going to uh, this is a joke in case you're wondering, okay? Some of you like looking like you're serious, okay? So he falls into this freshly dug grave, and uh, he, he's, uh, he tries to get out. He tries to jump and scramble. He can't. It's too deep. He thinks, well, they're going to bury somebody tomorrow, so I'll just, I'll just wait here. I'll just kind of, so he crawls up in the corner, and he thinks, I'll just wait, and then I'll yell when I hear noise tomorrow. Well, a, a few hours later, another jogger comes falls into the same exact grave. That guy, he starts jumping, trying to crawl out, and then he feels a hand on his shoulder. And somebody says, you can't get out of here. But he did. <laughs> you know, when we're, when we're motivated, when we, when we all of a sudden we see, hey, there's hope, it changes things. That certainly is the message of Easter, that God gives us hope, that God cares about us. And that uh, if we're looking for it, uh, God's there for us. Now, you know, if you go back to the very beginning of time, you have people that they, they sensed God was out there. A God, they did. I mean, just, there was some transcendent being. I think they just looked around and they saw all the created stuff, the heavens and the earth. And they just thought, wow, uh, there's... There's some being that created this. There's some transcendent being, but there is this huge, huge gap. How do we get from here to there? You know, this, this, this massive gulf. And uh, that's what I want to talk about today is how to bridge a chasm. Now, I asked my construction crew to help build a prop for me, and I said, I need a bridge. They built this, I think they, they thought I needed help because they built this massive bridge, huge bridge. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a great bridge. How, why do we need, why do we even make bridges? You know, I mean, they're expensive. They're hard to maintain. Uh, there's, the, the, there's a lot that goes into a bridge. Well, because of a, when there's a chasm, right? We want to get across a river. We want to get across a bay or maybe over a, a big gorge. And so we, at some point, people just get so tired of trying to get through there or they want it bad enough, they pony up, they pay the cost, and they build the bridge to, to get from one side, of the, uh, one side to the other. And that's certainly what it means when, when, we, when, when we look at Easter and God was interested in building a bridge. Now, people sense that there's been a chasm for years and years and years. I mean, um, God, God, he's, they just sensed he was transcendent and bigger and awesome and mighty and holier than me. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know that there's some dark parts in us. I mean, we say things and we, 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 we think things that aren't, that aren't all that nice sometimes. And, and we know inside of us we have uh, self-serving uh, motives and we're, we, you know, we just, we have prejudices, and there's injustice. I mean, all kinds of things inside us. And I think when, we, when we're willing to be honest about that, it exposes that chasm. It exposes that chasm. And all over the world, people that are honest look around and they see evidence of a created transcendent being, and then they look at within themselves and they realize there's a gap. 
he's like holier than me, and, and so I've got to try to reach out and connect with them. And that's what religions are. All over the world, if you look at the major religions, you will see that they are building a bridge, right? And, and so like here, if this was the bridge to uh, trying to build it to God, God's way over here, they're going to try to build a bridge. They're going to say, well, I need to try to walk a little straighter, and I need to be a little more religious, whatever that is. You know, I, I need to, to, to maybe do some charitable deeds, and if I do some, render some service and help people, and if I do that over and over and over for an entire lifetime, maybe I'll be able to bridge that gap over to this transcendent being. Listen, world religions all over, that is what they're all about, is building a bridge, trying to get over there. Unfortunately, you never really know if you make it. You never have a sense of, of, of validity or a sense of peace. I, I'm, I've made it. But you got to try. you just got to keep trying to get over to the other side. Now, if you study uh, biblical Christianity, you download a Bible, you read it, you'll find something amazing. That God realized, he looked at the situation, he goes, hey, that chasm's bigger than you ever thought. It's a massive chasm. And God took it upon himself. He took it as his responsibility. Motivated by love, he was going to build the bridge. And so he built the bridge from his side over to us. He's the one who built it. How did he do that, you might ask? He did it through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the message of Easter. That he, he built that bridge. Not, nothing that we could do. He did it toward us. And that's it's, it's just called grace. Now listen, in a nutshell, let me tell you the, the gospel of, of, of grace is that God loves you and he knows you and he wants you to know and love him just like he knows you. And so he's, he's looking, he sees this great chasm, this chasm of sin that separates it. He's perfect, we're not, I'm not, you're not. And so he came up with a plan. He thought, I'm gonna send my son, Jesus Christ, in order to bridge that gap in order to reach out to you so that you can be forgiven, so that you can know that you know that you know that you are right with God. And this is the message of Easter. It's different than other religions that are all over the world. It's remarkable, but that certainly is what it is. And that's why we call it amazing grace. Amazing grace. That's the first point on your outline is that God gives amazing grace to us. We experience it. Now, if you, if you picture in your mind the cross that Jesus hung on, you know, you have the, the vertical piece where his body was mounted and then his arms were on this crossbar. That crossbar really symbolizes well the bridge, kind of a bridge from God to us. Jesus was, he, he was nailed on that cross. He was perfect, but he was nailed on that cross in order to build a bridge built by God's hands. Purchased by his son. Notice this verse. That God is on one side and all the people on the other side. And Christ Jesus himself is between them to bring them together by giving his life for all mankind. This describes this bridge. One side is us, this chasm. The other side is God. We couldn't, as much as we try, if we just try on our own, it'll never be there. But God reached out to us. You know, years ago, I was trying to build a bridge to God. I mean, I, I didn't know. I, didn't, I, I knew there must be a transcendent mean. I was kind of what I just described to you. That's where I was at. I didn't know God personally. I wasn't sure if he existed. I just looked around and thought, you know what? He probably is. There's probably something out there. And so I had some kind of moral code that I created myself, some kind of ethical standard that I instituted that I thought, well, this will, I hope this is good enough because that's all I can really do. And I just tried to live that out. And I graded myself on a curve. You know, every time I saw somebody worse than me, I felt good. Hey, I think I'm doing okay. Every time there was somebody who was doing better than me, I kind of felt, you know, bad about it. And so I was just like, eh, they're just, you know, you know, judgment, all this. I'd throw words around and, and, and to make me feel better again. Because I didn't really know. And then one day somebody told me about the grace of God. That God did it for me. It's not about me working my way, trying to earn some points. 
And I needed a lot of extra points if I was getting anywhere. I, did, I gave that up. I just said, you know what? I don't have to do that. And that's the message of Easter for sure. That's the great news about Easter. Number two is I, I, I work towards restored relationships with others. Let me explain what I'm talking about here. When you discover that God loves you, that he cares about you, that he's reached out to you, that he wants to have a relationship with you, not a religion, but a relationship with you, it begins a dialogue where you start to converse with God. You start to discuss. And you, hey, this is what's going on in my life. This is what's happening. This is how I feel. This is my heart. And you start to share, and we call that prayer, of course, but it's this conversation. But part of a conversation is listening. And so we need to be able to listen to what God has to say. And he speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. He speaks to us through the Bible. If you open up the Word, you see God speaks. And he starts a renovation project on us right off the bat. The minute you invite Christ into your life, he begins a renovation project in you. It's not behavior mod. It's not like do a bunch of things. It's kind of a covert op within us. He starts to change the way we think. He starts to change our values. He starts to change the way we relate to people. And all of a sudden, when we walk across the bridge from that side to the other side, we start to have some evidence of the bridge maker in us. God, there's something in us that says, God made me a, a bridge towards me, and I didn't deserve it. And now I want to make a bridge towards others. People, especially people I'm not, you know, I'm having a hard time with. People, there's friction, there's conflict. Now listen, there's some people, a lot of people have conflict in their life and they're okay with it. I mean, if you're on the one side of the bridge where you're not really close to God and you're just doing your own thing, we kind of live with a lot of conflict. I mean, somebody at work gets angry and they storm out, they slam the door, they yell at you. As long as you don't bump into them too much, you're fine with it. Hey, that's, you know, that's whatever, you know. And uh, there's all kinds of resentment and anger. But it, some people have a very, very high tolerance for lots of conflict in their life. It's okay with them. They're fine. But what we, happens when we walk across the bridge to God, he says, he starts to stir something in us. says, that's not okay for you. That's no longer acceptable. I want you to build a bridge. Yeah, but they don't deserve it. You didn't deserve a bridge towards you. And so God starts to put something on us where we want to reach out to people that we have ought with, that there's a, where they've hurt us. And he starts to develop this distaste for unresolved chasms, relational chasms. Notice this verse here. It says, uh, all this comes... From the, from the God who settled the relationship between us and him. He's talking about that bridge he made to us and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. We're to build bridges. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. He says even beyond that, we help other people settle differences. We're bridge builders. It's the, the, kind of the... God's a bridge builder, and that part of him gets embedded into us, and we want that. Now, friends, some of you, this Easter, you're going to go to a lunch or a dinner, and you're going to, some of you, it's going to be uncomfortable because you have, you have conflict at home. You have conflict in your marriage. You have conflict in your, in, in between a husband and wife or a parent and a child. Maybe you have conflict at work, like I talked about earlier, or all kinds, and some of you, you need to do something about that today. When you go up to somebody, you say, you know what? I didn't think I could bridge this gap because I'm so upset at you and you hurt me so bad, but something supernatural happened to me today at church. And God showed me that with his help, I can do it. Now, this is the good news. The, the, listen, at Easter, the good news is that God will give you the courage because it takes supernatural courage to do what we're talking about. Courage. He'll give you the grace and he'll give you the wisdom. If you seek him, he'll give you the wisdom. How to do it? How do I do it? What's the best way? What's the best time? How do I go about this? He'll give you the courage. He'll give you the grace. He'll give you the wisdom. And you can do that. Where you reach out and you go, hey, I want to build a bridge towards that person. 
And as I said, uh, when, we just, when we started, you saw that bumper, we're, we're starting a, a, a series at Vineyard Community Church here next, starting next week about building bridges, relational bridges, how to do it. We're going to study it for eight weeks. How do we go about building those bridges when sometimes it's just very difficult? One last very large chasm that we need a bridge built over, and that's to give us a hope of heaven, of hope of heaven. Now, this is the one about eternity, right? About what's after we, after we die. A lot of people don't like to talk about death, right? I mean, it's just kind of uncomfortable. There's like this denial about it. You know, it's like almost as though, you know, it'll happen to everybody else, but not to me, right? And, and yet the, the odds of you dying are still at 100%. It hasn't changed, you know? I mean, but we don't like to talk about it. It's, it's so interesting. I came across some famous last words. These are the last words of some people when they were on their deathbed. Last thing they said. I want, I want you to see if you can guess who you think uh, said this. If you know, turn to the person next to you and just, and just tell them. Okay, Here's, here it is. Ready? Famous last word on the deathbed. I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Who do you think that is? Tell somebody next to you if you know. Somebody said last night, JFK, well, no, that's, I don't think he had time to say anything. He was shot. <laughs> you got to have enough time to say something. It's Nathan Hale. He was, he, he was uh, worked for uh, uh, George Washington. He was only volunteer to say, I'll go behind the British lines in New York. And, and as he was being hung, that's what he said. Next, there's another one, ready? On his deathbed. Now the mystery. You go, well, I know that. Okay, well, here it is. Henry Ward Beecher, right? The famous abolitionist. And uh, here's, how about this one? E2 Brute. Yeah, a lot of you get that. Boy, well-read people. Julius Caesar. Okay, next, here's one. I want to go, God. Please take me. Probably 100 million people have said that, right? But <laughs> This is Dwight D. Eisenhower said that. One last one. This is a true story. This is, somebody heard him say, the last thing he said, he said, please leave the shower curtain on the inside of the tub. That was Conrad Hilton. In fact, you can still see his quote in bathrooms all over Hilton's, all over the, all over. Obviously, that frustrated him, right? Well, even though we don't like to talk about death, the Bible says it's a reality. And we need to prepare for it. I mean, it only makes sense, right? If it's something inevitable that's coming, we want to prepare for it. I think the problem is we don't know how to prepare. We're not sure. We know it's, uh, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, heaven and hell, is that even real? And if it is, you know, how do we get on the right side of the ledger on that deal? And, and it's, just all, it's just confusing. So people just, I think that they just sweep it under the carpet. They don't really want to talk about it. And yet the Bible says it is something that you need to look at. And, uh, and, you need, and, and, and God doesn't want you to be afraid. You know, if you ever watch like football games or sometimes they'll in uh, uh, golf tournaments, they have people holding up signs that says 316. I don't know if you knew what that meant, but they're actually quoting a verse. They're quoting a verse. I think Tim Tebow had it written under his eyes back when he was in college football. 316. Well, that verse comes out of the gospel of John. And here's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He says there is a bridge built. God decided on his end, he was going to give his son, build a bridge so that you would know you have everlasting lasting life. That's a promise that God has for you. You don't have to be afraid. No, there's a lot of things to be afraid of. There's no doubt. In this day and age, I mean, there was some, you know, a bunch of churches blown up this morning in, uh, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, and, and there's terrorism all over, and there's plane crashes, there's disease, there's heart attacks, strokes, cancers, lots of things to be afraid of. A lot of people have that it, un, underneath this kind of uh, undercurrent of fear. But God says, I don't want that from you. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to have confidence that you know where you're going to go. In fact, so much confidence that you can actually look forward to it. Amen. Not in a morose way, but just like you know. And you're knower. You just, you're absolutely confident because of what God did. He gives you this peace. And you know he built a bridge to you. It's nothing we would have ever come up on our own. 
this idea of grace, that God builds a bridge to us, nothing we can do. And you start to look forward to it. Hey, I have something, I have something to look forward to. God's going to give me purpose today, a reason to get up today. He's going to give me a clean conscience. He's going to wash me new. He's going he's to empower me and embolden me. But he's also, there's something I can look forward to. God's going to do something. And, we, and, and, and it's all about believing. It's all about believing. Notice this. I love this verse here. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So this word believe is very important. That's a key thing that happens. What does it mean to really believe? Because some people say, hey, I believe in Jesus, that he, a man who lived 2,000 years ago. He was a good moral teacher. You know, he's, you know, all that. Well, that's not what he's asking. He's saying, we believe that Jesus was the bridge to me. Nothing I can do on my own to get to God. Jesus did it all. That's what it means to really, and then just, and then trust completely. That word believe means to cling to, to adhere to, to trust fully. You know, years ago, there was a great daredevil of his day, Charles Blonde, and he was kind of like the David Blaine of today, or, you know, he's like a Houdini or an evil Knievel. And he, one of the things he liked to do is do tightrope walking. And, and so he got a big crowd together up in Canada there at Niagara Falls, over, right next to that gorge, and he strung a tightrope all the way across the gorge at Niagara Falls. And he said, who here thinks I can get over to the gorge and back again on this tightrope without falling? Everybody goes, you can do it, the great Blondin. Yes, that's what they call him, the great Blondin. The great Blondin can do it. And so he does. He gets on this tightrope. He goes over. He comes back. They're all, yeah, we knew it. We, we, we knew it. And then he said, how many of you believe I can get on this tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow and get there and back safely? And they're all going, we believe you can do it, the great blonde. And one guy was kind of yelling louder than everybody else. Well, I believe you. And he looked at the guy and goes, do you believe? He goes, I do, I believe. He goes, well, then get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> That's a true story. Guy disappeared. <laughs> Boom. He didn't want to get in the wheelbarrow. But that's really what it means to believe. Not just that Jesus was a good moral teacher who lived years ago. It means I'm going to trust him with my life. I'm going to put my whole life into this and say, it's worth everything. I believe God's grace will carry me through, that, he's gonna, that he did everything. He's going to help me with, with what I need in order to reconcile relationships, gives me the courage and the grace and the wisdom, and I have something to look forward to in heaven. Last verse, Jesus makes this invitation. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and some of you can hear his voice, he's speaking to you right now, and has been this service, and opens the door, in other words, walks across that bridge, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. That's his invitation to you. No matter what situation you're in, he says, today's your day. If you hear my voice, now he's not talking about me, it's the Holy Spirit. God starts working on you, starts challenging you, saying, hey, come on. This is the day for you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Holy Spirit, I just invite you here right now. I pray that many will just say, this is my day to open the door. I'm going to walk across that bridge. I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to trust you with my life. Now, some of you, that is what God's calling you to do today. He, he knows what you're going through. He knows your, your own thoughts, your struggles, your ambitions, all of that. And he's drawing you. He's saying, lay down the hard hat and the trowel and the hammer, all the things you're trying to do to construct your life and orchestrate it. God's saying, I built the bridge to you. You don't have to do it anymore. You don't have to do it anymore. So you come to the point in your life where you just say, hey, is it up to me? And you just keep working so hard trying to 
uphold everything. There's an incredible release when you can just let that go. This will be the best Easter ever for you if this is the day that you decide I'm letting it go. I'm going to trust God with my life. This is not about joining a church. This is about you getting a close relationship with the creator of heaven, with your heavenly father through Christ Jesus. And so some of you, you're sensing God's drawing you. He, and, there, and there is a response. It, it, that's God doing that. That's not me preaching. That's the Holy Spirit does that. He's drawing you. And you have a responsibility to him to respond in conversation and prayer. To say, to say I'm ready. I want to walk across that bridge. So whether you're listening to me or you're online, I'm going to invite you to do that. You just got to make a decision right now in your mind to say, I'm ready to walk across that bridge. I'm ready to say that prayer. I'm not going to have you come forward necessarily. I'm not going to have you uh, do something to embarrass yourself, but I'm going to ask you to say, yes, I'm ready right where I'm at to walk across that bridge. And you need to let God know I'm ready. And I'm going to ask you to do that confidently and boldly. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. If you're saying, I'm ready to pray that prayer, would you do that? Raise your hand. Raise it high. Thank you. Bless you. Raise it high. Keep it up. Bless you. A number of you are doing that. Say, I'm ready to walk across that bridge. Yep. Thank you, Lord. Okay, put your hand down. Now I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for those who said, I'm ready to let go of all of my own stuff, my own working my way. I want to walk across that bridge. Okay, it's your turn. Just whisper right where you're at. You pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for dying for my sins, that chasm. Okay, just whisper that. Thank you for bridging that chasm that separated us. Today, I put my trust in you. I'm going to get in the wheelbarrow and give you my life. And I surrender today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.